Hey everybody, what's up? Cedric here. See our wrestling commentary. Now I'll be reviewing SmackDown because this is SmackDown ish, where I review pretty much all that I care to review about SmackDown. So let's just jump on into this. So it was a nice opening with commentary doing a rundown of the matches as per usual, showing the competitors, which, you know, I, I like that. That's good. That's good. Let you know what you're in for, you know. But for me, who like wrestling, you don't have to tell me who's wrestling. Just get to the wrestling because I just want to see the wrestling. That's what I want. I want to see the wrestling. So when they click to Randy Orton, he gets a good pop from the fans and then his music hits to another pop. And then he halts to go argue with Triple H who he got words for him as well. He was sitting from the observation corner or gorilla position. Um, but I love the shot of this as, you know, it transitions to the entrance and explains the whole posture that he has. Because, you know, Randy's like, man, he's got that thing going. You know, back in the day, you'd not know why someone looked like that. They just come out looking annoyed and looking back as if, you know, like, well, that's just it. I mean, that's all you got. So I like how they do it now. I, I like that. You get to see, hey, there was a situation, yada, yada. And yes, was it pre-planned? Yes. Did they do that? Yes. So um, it was just like, all right. So, you know, he, the fans, they, they, they're singing and, and whatnot, and it's good. Um, Samantha does her alleged last announcement of, of his match or intro or whatnot. Uh, since she has some kind of Oscar winning performance of a goodbye, like, hey, y'all, I'm not burning bridges. I <laughs> love you all. You're great. You're special. Everyone that leaves WWE does that. And I always felt that they were a deer in headlights. There was great fear. And then I listened uh, only to a part of Stevie Richards, the Stevie Richards show which I do highly recommend. Go back and listen to episode one all the way up to, I think he's on 18. Uh, so that, yeah, that explains a lot. He explained a lot in his latest episode. Uh, so, or and he's angry that he can't fight Owens. And he calls Triple H out claiming that he's protecting Kevin Owens. Triple H rather not do this in public, but he brings to light Orton has a tardiness problem. Triple H tells him the match won't happen, not because he's protecting Owens, but because he's protecting Orton. And the fans are chatting RKO. Okay. Triple H explains that Owens has only done business. He doesn't have a friend. He has people, but once they get in his way by any means, he hurts them to get what he wants. But for some reason, Kevin dropped his guard. And he explains that Kevin Owens trusted Cody and Randy. Uh, liked, he liked maybe the good guy in Cody or the miserable prick in Orton. And Orton had to, so he had to smile on that one. And I like how Orton was calling out a lot of he and Triple H's history. They did a lot in that. So Triple H has let you know, like, so to Kevin, in his mind, they turned on him. So Triple H bringing up Orton medical history, that put him out, you know, of what, 18 months that he said, and he doesn't want to lose him again. And Orton is like, man, I didn't want to see this Triple H. I don't want to see the suit. I don't want to see you know this other guy i don't want i want the cerebral assassin and stuff yeah i'm like okay you can see triple h trying to have turn it on but also trying to not turn it on at the same time <laughs> you can see it the fans was popping for it orton talks up taking care of business the way they ever had the only way they ever had to when things like this happen and it was like he says please i beg of you hunter and i'm like oh my goodness now for those that don't have much of a memory, Randy Orton back then, you could easily put one, maybe two of him in this Randy Orton. This Randy Orton is a big dude. He is fighting 
tooth and nail, his body trying to gain all the weight it wants to. He is fighting. He's got like a power lifter's build. So that Randy is scrawny compared to this Randy. Although I got to say that Randy had a much better opening boasting taunt, though. I, I liked it better. Um, the fans chant, let them fight. Orton is hyping it up. Triple H is like, you want this? You want this? Do y'all want this? He's making sure. And he says, I hope that God, you all know what you're asking for. So that right there just puts on, although I hated this program on PBS, great expectations. Triple H gives the go and, whew. So then he says what anyone would say before a major boxing match. Because he says, and I hope you protect yourself at all times. And I'm just like, so in other words, this gives a great opening and credence to the Attitude Era and things like that. Sad to say that this should be a series. And I can see it going until December where Owens gets beat at whatever they're going to do in December or maybe even the Royal Rumble and then he's gone. That's if he's going to AEW. Or this series might be what they're doing to entice Kevin Owens to stay. I'm not sure exactly how the business deals are going down, but that's what it seems like. And I'm, li I'm liking this because... The, now, I don't know if they're going to do it or not, but what Triple H says, protect yourself at all times, that means you don't know when Kevin is going to strike. You don't know when Orton is going to strike back. It's, there's a chance they can make this as pandemonium as they can. Not in a quote-unquote big push, but a grand spotlight. So we're going we're gonna to have to just sit back, buckle in, and see where this goes. So then we got L.A. Knight who comes to the ring as a special referee for match number seven between Andrade and Carmelo Hayes. So it's those two against each other. And Knight is wearing khaki pants, referee shirt, leather vest, shades, and the U.S. belt. Not sure how to feel about this, though. <laughs> because I had to know this attire is funny. It's unorthodox. It's silly. And in a bit... It expresses just how much he doesn't care about either of them winning. I'm going to come out here in a capacity that the only thing referee of me will be my actions in the ring and this vertical black and white striped shirt. That's it. <laughs> Even Commodore had to bring up, oh, I'm not sure about this attire. You know, he's wearing the so shades. Sad. You know, so. so oh, so what's up? Does that imply if you're a referee, you won't be wearing pants? I mean, he, he'd be wearing pants, but they would be, you know, the black pants or whatever they, they, they're going to do. He he was wearing khaki pants. He could have been going to a dinner. <laughs> it's Colt Boatman, everybody. Yep. Uh, He just joined in. So you just let y'all know, y'all can voice bomb here, you know, in this. Not a live show, so if something jump off, I can go back, edit it, edit it out or whatnot. I have that power. You know, just like he man, I have the power. Not going to do any echo or nothing like that. I ain't got time for it. So. <laughs> so. I'm, I'm just waiting for that one match. Oh, you wait, wait, for this match here? No, I'm waiting for the match. Okay. Because there's a match I'm about to, I'm going to skip over, like, brutally. Um, so, L.A. Knight, he uses the most traditional referee rules to get heat on him. And he did a perfect job at it. He didn't let Hayes attack Andrade in the corner. He stopped Andrade from diving so that he could put the ring out count on Hayes. And the wrestlers, they used Knight's nice positioning to attack each other over his back. So, that was good. Uh, get a good cheer from the fans. The problem is you don't want the fans cheering the heel which would be Carmelo Hayes, who's a really good heel. I wouldn't say a masterful heel, but you're getting the fans to cheer him, cheer him because of the referee being a referee. So that shows the intelligence of, of L.A. Knight and or whoever booked it this way and told him what to do. Um, so they both get their stuff in, um, Andrade and Hayes. 
they both get their stuff in, and fans are deeply into this match. It seems like they're cheering for both of them. Hayes kicks out of a pin that throws Andrade on tonight, who steadily recovers, doesn't see that Hayes has rolled up Andrade. The fans were even counting on this one. I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of bad. You don't want the fans to be counting for the damn heel. You don't want that. Knight argues with Andrade for not seeing what he had done, and then he caught an quote-unquote accidental foot jab by Hayes. I do not call it a super kick if it doesn't lay him out. It's that simple. Um, but Hayes doesn't even care about it too much anyway because he's a heel. Um, Hayes hit the suplex cutter and cover with no referee. I wish they would stop doing that. I get what it's for, and it does help at points if you don't know the referee is down. But when you know the referee is down, don't cover him. Just keep beating on him or something. Or try to revive the ref, hit him with another move, go for the pin. I think that's the smartest thing to do. Um, Knight recovers enough to attack Hayes and throw him into the announce table. And the commentary had to bring up, does he disqualify himself? <laughs> In the ring, Andrade attacks Knight after a brief argument and a little tongue lashing. And Knight hits the BFT on him. And I had to know at that point, we all know where this is going. Three-way dance in Saudi Arabia. So Hayes gets in the ring, talks to Knight. Hayes didn't even do anything, and Knight hit him with the BFT, the blunt force trauma. Oh, my goodness. So Knight goes out of the ring, rings the ring bell, makes the official rule. It says, with, the bo with, with a body of losers in the ring, the winner of game seven is L.A. Knight absolutely comical and that's something that I'm guaranteeing you The Rock or Steve Austin would have done and or said but in their own way. Backstage Aldis makes the match triple threat match between Knight, Hayes and Andrade and Knight doesn't even seem to care. And that's this persona anyway. Uh, in another match Naomi pins Candice LeRae so there we go. Uh I saw that match. Eh. Yeah, I watched some of that match. I'm going to tell y'all, tell you this. The, I hate was Naomi's that, entrance. What What was you going to say? I was. The match was just. Eh. That's actually where I started the show when I went into the stream. See, I wait until the next day to start watching because watching during the stream is just going to be all choppy and whatnot. I'm not telling y'all where to get the stream. You got to find nah. it yourself. <laughs> nah. nah, my own issue was that my own internet was just being fucking what? I sat there. If, if you were new to this product and you started watching that and that was your first match, you wouldn't watch any more of this product. Yeah, so let's get back to the Naomi entrance thing. We talking about the music or what she does? What she does. She gets in the ring like somebody that should be on OnlyFans. She looks like she's average. Like, I'm a stripper and this is what I do. That's what her so, ring entrance was. So, sounds like average, ruthless aggression diva stuff. Yes. Yes. Uh, it, it, it annoyed me. And I was like, really? You can't come to the ring and be serious? You got to do all the stripper stuff? Um, and get her a pole and some dollar bills. That's that's pretty much what I, I thought. And a lot of the girls do this. And that's what turns me off to women wrestling in most of these companies because they all do the same thing. Come to the ring. Be serious. You're in there to fight. You know, you, you, if, you, if you watched, you know, uh, Japan's Gaia, you know, or... Um, I don't know how it is now, but women of wrestling, wow. Well, actually, women of wrestling entertainment, then, you know, they come in and it was like, we're here for a match. We're here to do business. This crap that they're doing now, I, it, it's a turnoff. I don't want to watch a woman's match and then try to get an erection. I want to watch a woman's match and watch wrestling. It, that's, that's what I want. Yeah. So I, I just knew Naomi was going to win because it's not, a, it's not a big match. So she's going to win. So then Cody and Gunther, they 
must now talk at each other. And you know how this is going to go. Contract signings, getting the ring and talk. Cody comes out and on his on the corner when he's boasting, Gunther's music plays the block, the whoa. They are both in suits, belts on the shoulders, mics in hand. And suits don't mean a fight won't break out. This is just talking in a fight always break out. So Gunther asks Cody, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> Half stealing his thunder. Cody wants to know the why from Gunther on winning the crown jewel belt. And Gunther says that Cody mentioning, he said, I'm going to get to the answer, but he says, you know, you mentioning your daughter last week had nothing to do with anything. It's about being the best champion only. And Gunther cites that Cody is trying to live up to other people's standards and expectations. And Gunther's why is because he's living up to his own standards and expectations. And Gunther wants to know Cody's why with 100% honesty. The fans not around. None of this is happening. Nothing to pop you or nothing. Just why are you doing it? Cody says that's the stupidest question he's ever been asked. And he basically says, without any of them, the fans, none of this would exist. And that's true. Because all you would have is, let's have a wrestling company. Let's make a wrestling company. The fans don't show up. There's no ticket sales. There's nothing going on. No one can get paid. The buildings can't be paid for. You've got no company. It's that simple. Sounds like AEW. Yeah, because AEW, they're going negative. All they got are their <laughs> hardcore fans. And the people in the arena are the people that are there because they want to get out the house and see some wrestling. It might be good. <laughs> That's what <laughs> Cody owns being called dramatic and the whole Cody crybaby crybaby thing. He's like, that's what we are. We're dramatic. You see my brother, you see me. And that, that was a nice callback to Dustin's gold us days. And, and he said, and I, and my family, we can drop anybody at any moment too. And that was a clear warning. <laughs> Cody says, and I like that before you were, before you came here to be known as Gunther. So that was his you know, re re reference in that he was Walter or Walter, whichever you want to pronounce it, uh, over where he's from, Volkswagen. So Walter with the kind of a V-ish W sound. So, and he says that he had everything, that Gunther has everything as champion, but he didn't have the responsibility and then Gunther says that he gets the same request and everything that Cody does, but he has the guts to say no to anyone from the boss to the fans. He proclaims that if Cody doesn't say no, then his whole little story will be over. And that makes him a gutless champion. And the gutless champion will always be secondary to Gunther. I loved it. I thought that was awesome. Cody talks up having guts, always having guts. And that leads Gunther. Um, and that, Go that Gunther being out there and being who he is a champion, he leads no one or nothing. And that Cody has the guts to do a whole lot of stuff. And he has the guts to end this conversation and throw the first punch. And then he does. And I'm like, you're the baby face. How did he rile you up like this? And the thing is, Gunther was looking angry first. And there were parts of Cody that came out that sounded like his dad. The way that he pronounced certain things. Because the Dusty voice that you know, like, look everybody, I'm trying to talk. That's not Dusty's voice. Cody sounds real close to Dusty's tone. But Dustin has his dialect. It's awesome to hear it. Uh, but then Imperium hits the ring, beats down Cody, and then Randy runs out and dispatches with them. So the baby faces win. Yay. <laughs> There's some long segments up here. Um, what did you think about that? You there, Colt? Oh, I thought you just talked to your wife. No, she in the back. She's at work. 
It's one twenty one p.m. Ah, yeah. Yeah, it was actually a pretty, it was actually a pretty cool segment. Not gonna lie, the both of them just look very sophisticated and serious about all this. Yes, I got it. Especially admit. when we're, especially but, when we're talking about a title that everyone has to drag around a fucking oversized briefcase. Yeah, I'm tired of seeing that thing, but I get it. I, I just, I'm just tired of it though. Cause look, I mean, if they at least defended it constantly, or at least once a month, I would be okay with it. This is but they're bringing a giant box. And the thing is, like, I guess some hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's how much it costs, or probably close to the millions of dollars. And I'm like, if you, if your belt costs that much and needs that much security. When they win it, what do they do? They don't even, do they get to wear it? They wear it only at certain moments, you know? And, and the security for that belt can't whoop either one of them. So what's the point of the security? From the fans? The fans ain't jumping the rail. They're going to prison for, for five to 20 years. So, because that's a, that's a, that'd be attempted grand theft. More than grand theft. But it's, uh, it just looks bad. It looks weak. <clears throat> I swear, some F1 team actually did something stupidly similar. F1 team? What's that? Formula One. Okay. I didn't know if you talked about racing or something wrestling. Okay. Oh, the Jaguar F1 team for the Ocean's 12 advertisement. Oh, good grief. Where they, where they put $200,000... Steinmetz diamonds on the nose cones, cones of both cars. <coughs> that's a lot. That, that's that's a lot. Of course. Why do you think I'm complaining about the belt? <laughs> <laughs> you are spending almost a million dollars on a useless fucking belt. Yes. No, no. In a show. That only exists because a group of people won't stop killing journalists. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was funny. <laughs> uh, what's the next segment? It's the announcement for Crown Jewel. Women tag champs will defend their belts against three other teams in a fatal four-way. Oh, God damn it. It's the all the women standing in a row. Yeah. I was like, this is stupid. That was dumb. That was boring. You shouldn't put it on. You shouldn't even go to Saudi Arabia in the first place it, with it, the women. It, was, it wasn't It was even boring. It was just pure stupid. Why are they in a row? Yep. I, I just. I am not. Uh, I was, don't take women to a place they're not welcomed. It's that simple to me. Uh, any case, so we get the number one contender tag team match, do it yourself or DIY versus Motor City Machine Guns, and oh, oh my God, I love the match. You did. <coughs> it was it was a classic. Love... It was a classic tag team match. It doesn't help that it just made me be like, holy shit! Like a decade or two ago, I saw. Motor City Machine Guns just be pure TNA. And now they are here. They got nowhere else to go. <clears throat> They've got nowhere else to go. The Hardys pretty much taking their spot in TNA. TNA don't do well with tag teams. Their tag matches are subpar now. I got bored with their tag matches because there's nothing about them that seemed like tag team wrestling anymore. And the the Hardys is not Jeff is Matt, he's he's lost. How can I say his mystique is dead. There's nothing cool or special about Matt Hardy, because that's what he did to himself. It's like you want him to be cool, you want him to be special, and he goes out and says, "Well, you know, I'm gonna dispel that crap," and ah, so. They're here, and I like this match. Um, I know it could have been better. I know how. Yeah, it could, <clears throat> yeah, it could have been, but it was still a fun match. Yeah, can't deny that. Shelly and Gargano they tie up. Commentary gives a good background on them. It's been 
so long since I watched Alex Shelley in action with detail. So I can say for sure where Lee Moriarty adopted his Border City stretch. Because I remember Shelley doing that. And it was, it was legit finishing hole. People would tap to. And I've seen others use that before him. I think Yuji Nagata was one of them. I think Liger was one, but it was more transitional hold than anything else. So not sure, but I do like that move. And when Gargano almost got it on him, he had to get up out of it. And I like that they announced that, yeah, Shelly was the one that taught him that move. So that's pretty good. Um, I like the commentary has to mention the background for this, uh, for, you know, for this, you know, they're new to WWE team. How much of this stuff is legit and how much is not, that remains to be seen. Now, you know, yeah, we slept on the floor together. We was on the Indian stuff. I'm like, I mean, I don't know. It could be true. Could not be true. I don't know. WWE got a habit of being dramatic. <laughs> Shelly and Gargano, they show a great deal of in-ring admiration after a nice wrestling exchange. Motor City Machine Gun, they get this stuff in and then Gargano turns things around by foiling a signature move. During the break, they got the heat on Alex Shelley, which is the part that the fans at home need to see. You know, you need to see that person getting beat down. That's what you need to see. Um, also, I had to note that seeing that, um, <clears throat> seeing that at a time, Saban and Shelley partnered with Kushida, I'm wondering if WWE would bring Kushida back just for them, if they would do, if they would do that, because... One, it's going to be hard to use Kushida correctly, and at his size, he's best used in tag team or outside manager stuff going on his size compared to everybody else. And, oh, man, Kushida, I, last seeing him in New Japan was some of his best stuff before he got injured during a match uh, with uh, Hiromu Takahashi, that sunset flip bomb that rattled him really good. Um. Let's see, in the ring, Saban turns things around with a diving crossbody, giving Shelly the chance to put some hurt on DIY. While both teams entered and the faces, and, and oh man, this it, they get a little convoluted, but they keep, I like how Motor City Machine Guns keep things separate enough so nobody has to really cross paths but so much, but it's like DIY is so used to WWE stuff, you can see them trying to get things close so everyone gets mangled together. It was a clash of styles. Um, now, both teams entered as faces. DIY, they're the heels because mainly Champa is doing all the dirty work, yanking them off the apron, cheap shots here, um, few questionable dirty tactics here and there. It's stuff like that. So you got to have heels that they, they're going to be it. Um, DIY hit a sidekick power driver. And then a bicycle knee strike from Champa for a two count on Saban. Which I don't think Saban really should have kicked out of that, period. I really don't. You catch a kick to the abdomen or the face. I couldn't really see it from the camera angle. Then dropped on your head. Then I don't know if he's, I can't remember if he sat up on his own, but he caught that bicycle knee strike. That really should have been it. The power driver should have been more than enough. But the way things are today, it's, it, Oh, man. So Saban creates a miscue where Gargano super kicks Champa off the apron. Super kick because it laid in the Champa. Champa was down. That's a super kick. Motor City Machine Gun hit the net breaker diving body press that they call Skull and Bones. One, two, three. They celebrate. Bloodline come out led by Solo Sokoa. And then, all, then they go to the break, come back. Aldis intervenes. Nick Aldis. And Solo says that Everything's okay, tells Brooklyn to shut up and then acknowledge him, chorus of booze. Solo introduces the bloodline and tells MCMC, Motor City Machine Guns, that he is their tribal chief. <laughs> so he's like, okay, well, tribal chief. So he introduces himself as Shelly, and then Solo decides to mock him. Uh, Solo has a, a good line saying, since you two want to make an impact for yourselves, we can fight now. You can hear the crowd, ooh. <laughs> All this wants their match to be fair. And it's like, we're not going to do this because they're not 100%. They just got done with the match. And Shelly, he's like, no, let's, let's, let's do it now. And that's always been Shelly's MO. Just, no, I don't care how beat up I am. Let's do it. 
So, you know, like, and it's just after the match. They tired, sweaty. They look not so at ease. So, you know, but all this, like, you sure? He makes real sure. You agree? You agree? He's like, all right, then get a ref down here. And I'm like, okay. The fans pop for it. And this is why I get some reservation. And I'm not happy at the outcome for a couple of simple reasons. But now, hold on. Now, before you talk about it, okay. let's think about this for a moment. This is TNA versus New Japan. Basically, yeah. In a WWE ring. Yeah. How how, how often? T- just tell someone, like, 20 years ago, hey, people from this New Japan company that's currently in the middle of the Enochism period... And a company that is rising, held by Jeff Jarrett, are going to have their wrestlers main event a SmackDown in 20 years. Do you realize how many people are going to be like, what kind of smoke are you potting? Yep. And it's like, can I have some? Because that is some good shit. <laughs> yeah, that, WWE would never have hired them. Period. They wouldn't have done it because of their history. And... It won't that long ago uh, that I was watching these two teams battle Gorillas of Destiny and Motor City Machine Guns fight in New Japan Pro Wrestling. So I'm like, I won't even think about that. So I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you jumped in the voice bomb because that's something I wouldn't have brought up. You know, these two teams from different promotions and commentary also bringing up that these well, they didn't bring up TNA. I don't know. Something's wrong because they mentioned TNA before, but now they're not. And I don't know. Maybe something went wrong or maybe like yeah. me, they're so into it, they forgot to bring it up. But these two teams are champions from various promotions. Gorillas of Destiny made their home to me in New Japan. So what you said, I'm like, that's true. TNA versus New Japan in WWE SmackDown. <laughs> wow. That's, you know, that's, people don't know how deep that is. Yeah, give them some time and some research papers that they'll, they'll understand perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> to a lot of people, as crazy as it is, they are so deep and loyal, like tribally loyal to WWE. And it kind of, I'm like, what? But they never heard of Motor City Machine Guns. Never. When they came out, when I mentioned the last week's review, they, the, most of the fans didn't even know who they were. Some, you can hear that about a third of the fans were chanting their name. They were screaming for them. The rest didn't even know who they were. That's, that's some, they're, they're institutionalized in WWE. Those fans don't know anything outside of it. <laughs> yeah I mean I've I, I there's one topic I would say for off the stream but let's get back to the match alright so the match now WWE Tag Team Championship Bloodline also known to those Gorillas of Destiny but for this they're the Bloodline versus not the Motor City Machine Guns Machine Guns were also kind of almost a one word thing that they did but now they are Motor City Machine Guns and see I've been catching that last week and this week they're not the Motor City Machine Guns they're just Motor City Machine Guns they will not say the the only time they say the is in a grammatically correct sentence <laughs> so that's and they still got some of their old stuff um So the bell rings and they start off fighting. Bloodline takes over after being knocked from the ring and beat down. They beat down Alex Shelley while making sure that Saban can't stay on the apron for the tag. So they did good with that, but that was uh, after commercial break. So we don't get to see all of the beat down. The fans are. But of course, you get to hear the. We will be together on the goldfish. Forever. 
Because that's apparently more important than the wrestling match. It is. The fans got to sing. They got to chant. They got to get all that in. And, you know, they, the fans, that they, they start chanting. They want Roman. Commentary bring up that Motor City Machine Gun. And they called him the Bloodline. So they got to get a new name because they will not sell that out. So they called him the Bloodline, have fought in New Japan. So they mentioned it, but they called him the Bloodline. They did mention once that they were called Gorillas of Destiny, but that was way a, a few months ago. Jimmy Uso, he attacked Solo Sokoa, and the Bloodline beat him down. Then the ref is taken out via spinning back elbow in the corner. Roman's music hit. He and Jimmy beat down the Bloodline, and they fight off. And I had to note that Motor City Machine Gun need to lose, screwed out of the match. They have not built themselves up enough. There's a reason for this. Um, and I also had to note that Bloodline has not been recognized as a tag team to beat. Those are two important things. They are deeply important. But the fans chant yeet because isn't it obvious? And then he shows up. What were you going to say? Of course it was obvious. <laughs> yep. He shows up. Super kicking Loa, and then Tonga in the ring, followed by a few chair shots and a spear. And uh, so, look, just as weird how it sounded, but just to, I'll, I'll, I'll reread that to the way to separate things. The fans chant Yeet, and he shows up super kicking Tonga Loa, and then Tama Tonga in the ring, followed by a few chair shots and a spear. <laughs> I love mixing their names up and that might leave people behind. So my bad, but I have fun doing that. But, but that was good revenge. You know, Jay got some good revenge because he lost the belt. Thanks to them. Motor City Machine Gun, they, they hit their finish and gained the belt to a massive pop. My issue is they'll have them, these belts for a moment. And then the people will start calling for them to lose them to either DIY or Street Profits or back to the bloodline. It don't take long. It's like, oh, they won. They've been champion for two weeks. They need to lose the belts. They've been champions for too long. So it was a great celebration with Pyro. And let's not... I, I, ha I have to stop you for one moment to say this. What? Third match. Think so? No, no, think about it. It was their third match that they just won the titles. Yeah, they mentioned it. Commentary, yep. They did. Their third match. That so, is... you know, hey, you come in, be us, you win the belts. Okay, cool. They do that with everyone. That's the WWE shtick. WWF to WWE. That's the shtick. Someone come in, win the belt. Like, they probably told Christian uh, Cage, hey, come back, and you will you know, from TNA... And we'll give you the belt. All right, cool. He got back, yeah, and they gave him the IC belt, made him a mid-card comedy act like Jeff Jarrett said that he would, and then that's it. Yeah, the last yeah the last time they actually got a chance to win a match was on the first of was one six, not January six, but June first. Ah, June first. Okay. Not that, yeah, the, the, everyone else does their dates that way. The day, the month, the year. Yes, and they are the reasons why they don't have a flag on the moon. <laughs> now that's heel work for you. <laughs> but here we go. <laughs> no, best... man, I got to give you credit for that one. That was, that was good. <laughs> now we get to the fun part. So... When I said, and I said this, that, and I was like, let's not get it twisted. The fans didn't want Motor City Machine Guns to win. They wanted the bloodline to lose. It sort of reflects politics today. So Jay stands in the ring, and then his brother comes out, and then they hug. Then Roman comes out, and he stands at the entrance looking, looking on with worried uncertainty. In scene, worried, worried uncertainty. To me, it looked like he was just sad. 
I wanted to put that, and I'm like, Ugh. the way he looked, he looked like the kid that wanted to join the others, but he knows he's not accepted, but he really wants friends that bad. That's how he looked. Yeah, that that's what I saw as well. He just looked like someone that's like, the fuck have I done? Yep, but we'll see how this go, getting the original bloodline. You know, OTB, original, you know, or OB, OBL, original bloodline. I don't know. OB, I don't know. Obstitution. Yeah, me and, my, me and my friend Mal had a discussion about who the fourth partner was going to be. Our options were either Cody Rhodes or Sami Zayn. Not Cody. Cody has distanced himself from this. He ain't even in it. Sami Zayn has history, positive history. The unofficial Samoan. Um, it's possible, but don't forget. I think WWE has signed Hikuleu. They signed him, or they've been working with him. I don't. I don't know. It's been, it's been a bit. We're gonna have to just see how this goes. And there are other Samoans and Tongans out there with a great, you know, history and being trained. So, you know, it's up in the air. You know, uh, Zemo and I had our thoughts on things, and it's going about the way we said. It's happening a little longer, taking a little longer to get there, but Orton is gone, Owens is gone, Cody is gone, um, Roman's got to get his stuff back together, the Usos, they're back, but how will they, will it be tumultuous or not? We don't know. And we, so Hikaleo, if he joins, Honestly, it makes sense that he would join Solo Sokoa. So, if Sami Zayn joins, he'd have to leave Raw. So, ah, uh, that. But then, but then, but then again, Sami Zayn would now be on SmackDown. Yes. And Sami Zayn has plateaued. He's done everything on Raw. So going to SmackDown, that would I assume after a little bit that would be. When Kevin, after Kevin Owens leaves, because if they're on the same show, then that's going to be like, oh yeah, this we're saying Kevin Owens is going to stay, and there's going to be something with them. So, it's that just depends. Yes, because the Sammy Owens rivalry will never end, no matter how many tr times you try to end it. Exactly. And so, there's a there's a lot there's a lot to go through, a lot to ponder, and that's that means. The WWE is doing good business, bottom at the least, doing good business to have all these questions out there and wonder who's going to do what, when and where and why, and what's going to be the outcome, and then where they're going to go from there. I don't hear that including, stuff about other companies. In, including their South Park credits as shit. Yeah, the South Park. <laughs> that, that's about that what it threw, is. That threw me off guard like... They just had the South Park credits for the executive producers. And it's like, well, what the fuck? <laughs> I thought that episode of South Park was funny. I did. Because it did, it does, it mirrored real life probably a little bit too much. How WWE is all talk, all talk, all talk. And that's what people want to see. And then when they start fighting, they say, oh, it's fake. <laughs> well, I'll be right back. I've just been given a mirror. <laughs> oh man but look I'm going to end it here so I hope y'all enjoyed this and this a y'all can voice bomb when you want just come to discord but it's been Cedric and Colt Boltman for CR Wrestling Commentary on Smackdown-ish and with that we want y'all to be cool be chill be safe and we'll see y'all next time